on April 13th from 12.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. and the cost is $20. However, you can currently get an early bird discount of 15% off until March 29th and students are always 15% off. However, if these prices are prohibitive to you in any way, please get in touch with me and we can figure something out. And the second event that I wanna talk about that I think you guys are gonna be really excited about uh, is our biodiversity panel. Since the beginning of the wildlife webinar series in December, I've alluded to a roundtable panel discussion on the state of biodiversity in New Brunswick. And I am very pleased to announce that it's been scheduled for Tuesday, April 13th at 6.30 p.m. So it's the same day as the conference, but in the evening. However, this panel, like all of these wildlife webinars, is completely free and open to anyone to attend. And also please note that April 13th is a Tuesday. I know that these webinars have been on a Wednesday, but this one is a Tuesday. And as you can see, we have a powerhouse of a panel, if I say so myself. We'll be featuring the voices of the Wollastoke Grand Chief, Ron Tremblay, CPAW's New Brunswick Executive Director, Director Roberta Clowater, the Head of Natural History at the New Brunswick Museum, Don McAlpine, of whom many of you may remember from the wildlife webinar he gave back in February on bats, Lisa Petir, the Director of Vert Rivage, and Philippe Saint-Ange from Parks Canada. This will all be moderated by the Biodiversity Steering Committee Chair and Executive Director of Nature New Brunswick, Vanessa McDougall. These panelists will be able to provide a diversity of views and opinions on questions like, what exactly is biodiversity? And there will, of course, be lots of times for questions from the audience as well. So I encourage you to please sign up. The registration form is the same as this webinar. If you indicated that you would like to be signed up for all of the webinars, you are already signed up for the panel. But if not, please visit the link in the chat uh, that Vincent has posted or will post soon. I can't actually see the chat right now. Um, and we'll also let you guys know again at the end of the webinar. Okay, so time to get into today's webinar. Um, I would first like to thank the New Brunswick Wildlife Trust Fund, um, our funders for this webinar. This series wouldn't have been possible and uh, we're very grateful for their support. Um, we're also very grateful for the continued and general support of the New Brunswick Department of Natural Resources. We're also gonna be recording the presentation and it'll be available afterwards on the NBEN YouTube channel. So if you miss anything, you'll be able to view it again. And I'd also like to encourage everyone to use the chat throughout the presentation, leave your questions and your comments, and we'll have time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. So now, I feel like I've been talking forever. I've never talked this much before a webinar. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Nelson Poirier is a veterinarian by trade, but a naturalist by nature who has a passion for all of mother nature's community. However, owls are particularly special. And if it's any indication how passionate Nelson is about these critters, he only sent me this very short biography so that we could, and I quote, get right into it. So let's get right into it. And here is Nelson. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Nelson. Yeah, and share screen. Yeah. And remember to share sound as well. Oh, yep. Are we? I can see your slides and if you, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Okay. Go right ahead. Oh, I got this thing up here on mute myself uh, later. <laughs> yeah. There's something, there's something in the middle of my screen. I hope it's not in the middle of your screen. It says unmute myself and later. Can I just put later? Oh, unmute myself. Say later. Say later? Yeah. There. Okay, so it looks like we're all set to go. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, away we go. Uh, first of all, before we get into the slides, I uh, I, I would like to thank the New, Brun the New Brunswick Wildlife Trust as well, uh, Clara. They, uh, I was on a volunteer on that board for three years, and I couldn't think of any better thing to uh, invest funds to than these things here that uh, that you're doing. And, and also a lot, a lot of the, uh, mo most of this is photographs. Uh, um, some of them are mine, uh, a lot of them aren't. Uh, some of them have their names on it and some don't. So just so everybody's aware of that. 
Now, how come I won't go to the next one? Try clicking again. Did you click? Can you click the screen and it advances? There. Okay. There you go. Uh, uh, the. Um, the five that I'm going to spend a little bit more time with, uh, may, the, the Great Horned Owl is what the one we'll probably spend the most time with because uh, there's a lot that applies to the other owls as well. So uh, the, the, these are the ones that we'll sort of concentrate on the most. And ones that I will very briefly mention are these ones here. These are ones that might show up here. We might have a few breeding records in New Brunswick, but we just don't see them very often. And uh, this is not unintentional, this black screen. Uh, this is when you're going to see most of your owls after dark. So uh, the, the importance of knowing the, uh, the calls, the sounds of them are really important because uh, ac actually, if you have a good flashlight or a good light, you can put them, put it on an owl and they, they, don't, they don't flee, they don't fly away, they just sort of, look at you. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the first one that we're going to talk about is the, is the uh, great horned owl, which is, uh, I get it's not our, it's our, our biggest native owl. The snowy owl is a little bigger, but the, this is our biggest native owl. And uh, it's, it's, it's about a 22 inch bird. Uh, the, uh, how do I get into the special things first? Uh, the, uh, great, the great horned owl, the, uh, I guess I'm just going to go through slides gradually. Uh, the, the great horned owl, one really big thing here is this white, white bib that they have. This really does show up in the great horned owl as, um, whoops. And uh, I guess to go on about the, uh, I'm just going to just talk about the, the, the different points as we go through a few of these slides. Uh, look at these eyes. Uh, it's hard to beat the eyes of an owl for... <laughs> these eyes are not round. Most, uh, the, the eyes of most wildlife are, are round. And we're round with all these muscles attached and we can move them all around whatever we want. But the... the uh, the eyes of the owl are tubes, just like a binocular. In fact, that's what they are, they're binoculars. So if you ever see the skull of an owl, you're not gonna see a round eye socket, you're gonna see a tube. And uh, that, that's one of the reasons they can see so well, but also one of the reasons they can't move their eyes from side to side. In order for them to look around, they have to turn their head, which is uh, facilitated by something called the occipital uh, plantal joint in the neck, and that can turn 180 degrees. So they can just immediately check all, check all around them. And uh, the, the ears, uh, that's not showing the ears, yeah. The, uh, these ear, ear tufts are are not ears, they're tufts, tufts of feathers. Uh, the ears are da down in the head and we don't see them, but they're very, very unique because the, the, two, the two ears are not opposite each other. They're, they're, they are huge, the ear, ear cavity is huge, but they're, they're not opposite each other. They're at an angle and that's better to sight exactly where the sound of the prey or whatever they're after is coming from. And uh, that parabola in their face, that facial disc, that just acts like an antenna to, um, to, to, to bring in sound. And of course, you know, when you have uh, vice grips for jaws and uh, swords for claws, I mean, you're pretty well equipped to, to handle life. Uh, the, the great horned owl, like a lot of owls, in fact, I think all except one, don't build their own nest. They they all take over the nest. Uh, they don't they don't steal it from another animal, but or bird, but one that's been used before. Now this case here is an osprey nest that uh, a great horned owl took over. The uh, the uh, great horned owl, it it is it's nesting now, 
whereas the osprey aren't even here yet. So, you know, a few, a few will be used, but often a crow's nest, raven's nest. I mean, some of the nests that can be occupied by a great horned owl are absolutely incredible. And um, we, talked, we talked about the ears, the powerful talons. They're, they're um, feathers, the, the, the fe oh yes, also on the eyes of the owl, they have, uh, there's something called rods and cones and uh, it's rods that give that spectacular night vision that they have. The, uh, we'll get down a little further to the duetting. The, their diet, <laughs> if you run across a, a, a great horned owl uh, road killed or something, you're going to smell skunk. Skunks are no, a skunk uh, perfume is no problem for the great horned owl. <clears throat> and in fact, it's, it's one, of, one of their pop, popular diets. The, uh, the nest, this is a, a young one on a nest. This, this one would be quite young. <clears throat> no, you can't, you can't really see the nest there, but chances are that's a stick nest that's been taken over. Now, the, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing that the, the great horned owl and also the boreal owl to come, they can nest right in town. And in fact, uh, I live right in the middle of town right now. And uh, I, could, I walked out my deck about two weeks ago and I was regularly hearing great horned owls every night. So they have a territory right here. We, I have the, the subdivision I live in is quite, is quite an elderly one. And so there's lots of big trees. And, but, but this owl here, this was born last year in Riverview in the middle of a subdivision. So why, why in the heck are they in the middle of a subdivision? It's uh, yeah, here I am waiting for somebody to respond. Um, of course, it's it's food. So what's what sort of food are you going to find in a subdivision, especially with old trees? Uh, things like uh, squirrels, uh, gray squirrels, especially in Riverview. This happened to be in Riverview. This this the young fellow right here, and also the elephant in the room, rats. There's lots of rats in the city of Moncton. And uh, they and owls love rats. Uh, this uh, th this owl here, believe it or not, this tree <clears throat> was right beside the uh, home of Jane Wood, a very active naturalist. And uh, she had heard the owls hooting at night, but she had no idea where they were nesting, and it was right in her yard. So that's how secretive they can be in town. Now there, there he is right there. That, that's, that's, that's the same guy. And he's actually in the nest. I, if you can see that, I don't know how well you can see that nest, but that is a basket that got up a tree. Now how the basket got up the tree, I don't know, but I don't think the owl took it there. It took advantage of it being there. And uh, you know, the, these owls uh, at this age here, they, this, this guy's probably two, three weeks old. And uh, actually the one you saw before, it was outside the nest. And there's no way they can fly at that age. In fact, it'll be quite a while before they fly. But can they motor? <clears throat> they can go up and down a tree and up and down a branch with their claws and beak, no, no wings needed. And, uh, and, and they'll do that for, for about, uh, <clears throat> up to a month, up to a month with the parents feeding them. And uh, <coughs> I'm gonna mention in a minute about the parents feeding them, how you <coughs> know when they're around. Uh, I, wa I wanna mention about the importance of the male in, in uh, the great horned owl and several other owl, owls as well. Uh, the, the, the male is smaller, smaller than the, than the female. The female is about 25% bigger, but uh, the, the female will incubate the eggs on the nest and she will stay there for two to four weeks and he provides all the food. So if something happens to the male, something very likely will happen to the nest as well. Now in lots of birds, as, as you all know, and some mammals too, uh, the males, they uh, sort of hang around to contribute their genetic material and then they're off for the rest of the season, golfing and 
canoeing and all that sort of thing. But uh, with, with the owls, that's a totally different story. The male is extremely important and uh, an excellent an excellent parent. That, that just shows a few that are a little older, a little older again, but they certainly don't have their, their adult uh, plumages yet. But look at that, look at that uh, tough, uh, the tufts going right to the uh, talons. That's typical of mo most owls. Just uh, quickly looking at a few of the notes. Um, oh yes, the feathers in the uh, owls, they are extremely silent. You can be sit you could be sitting on a chair and an owl could come and land on your shoulder and you'd never hear it. They are so silent. And that's just part of their modus operandi. The, the feathers are very soft and, and the way they're uh, uh, linked in together, they just make no sound in flight at all. Now, when you hear a raven or something coming, you hear it, you know what, 300 yards away? Not an owl. Oh yes, and uh, uh, an owl, um, when they take prey, when they take prey, they do, it. They work it a little differently to a lot of birds. Uh, a, lo a lot of the times they'll take prey and you know the, the waste goes out the other end, but not so much with the owl. Uh, the owl will take in something like, let's say, it's, let's say it's a gray squirrel. Although this is not obviously a gray squirrel, but uh, they, they will uh, digest everything that's uh, digestible. And uh, when they're finished with it, they wrap all the, the stuff they don't want like feathers and fur and uh, uh, in a in the form of a pellet, it might almost look like feces, like a piece of poop. But uh, then the, all, all of a sudden, there'll be a great big, I guess you can call it, uh, untechnically a good big barf, and out it comes. And uh, an awful lot is learned from these pellets, because with DNA today, I mean, they can take apart those pellets, which, which is not a doesn't sound like a particularly savory occupation, but they they can tell exactly what that owl has eaten. And that's how they know the diet of owls. Another, another one there. And boy, doesn't that look suspicious like a claw of another bird? Uh, the great horned owl would not hesitate at all to take uh, some of the smaller owls. Let's, uh, and another thing I think when we're talking about owls, let's talk of them as large, medium, and small, because uh, that's sort of the case. Uh, the great horned owl is about 22 inches. That'd be about the same as a, um, a red-tailed hawk. Now, uh, th th this is just absolutely amazing. Uh, this, they're using all their skills. This is the feet landing in the snow. This is where the beak went to get the prey. And this is where the wings took off. Can you imagine what it takes to do that? to hear that little sound under the snow and be successful in extracting it. Just amazing. Now, uh, the, the one thing you're going to hear, of course, is the sound of the great horned owl. And, and, and it does sort of have a foghorn sound. So the first, the first part of the sound that I'm gonna play is, uh, <coughs> that's five-parted. <coughs> Really? Now that, that, that's the call you're going to hear. Now, now we're going to get... This, this, this is very li likely the uh, nestlings. And I want to tell you when the, when the nestlings... Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's sort of... Let's take that away. Whoops. Uh, when the when the nestlings uh, are probably of a when they're about uh, about to fly, and a little bit before those squeals, I want to tell you, they they'll just go up your back like a knife. Uh, at our camp one time, we 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 have a a great horned owl pair that has a territory there, obviously, because they, they, they nest there pretty well every year. And about uh, 
September, I guess, maybe late August, September, about 10 o'clock at night. I mean, uh, I think one year, I, they normally have about one or two. I think that year they had three, but it sounded more like they had 23. It was incredible, the sounds that they, the screeching that they make at night. And when, when they're screeching for food, uh, they, they want that food now, now. Uh, just to point out the, uh, the range of the great horned owl, look, up, look how large it is all over North America and down into South America. So there's a, a wide, uh, this, this bird has a very wide uh, range. Now the, the, the uh, let, let's get into the uh, uh, barred owl, which is probably the most likely one that you're going to see in here because it, it is probably the most vocal and the one that we tend to see a bit more during the day, not that much, but I mean, a bit more during the day. There they are nocturnal as well. But one big thing about the barred owl, look at those eyes, not yellow, they're black. That's the, uh, I think the only owl that we'll be talking about that has dark eyes. And of course, no, no ear tufts, no, uh, no, uh, no ear tufts at all on the, uh, on the barred owl. Really a neat owl. Look at that facial disc, that parabola that takes in the sound. Another nice picture of caramellas. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful bird. But you know, uh, they, they, most of them have that this gray tone to them, but uh, a, lot, a lot of them will have this brown ground color to them as well. So you can you can look for both colors. Uh, the uh, the boreal owls, uh, they uh, mostly like are uh, we can consider them cavity nesters, which being a cavity nester means that they will take a man-made owl box as well. So we'll get into that in a second. Now this is a baby uh, barred owl. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the story behind this. Uh, my, my wife and I had a camp up in Grand Lake uh, quite some time ago. And before the leaves come on, we noticed there was a snag and we saw this owl on top of it. We thought well, that was really neat. We could see it from our deck, put a scope on it and see it from our deck. And we kept seeing it. And son of a gun, we realized that darn thing is nesting there on top of this snag. Uh, and anyway, I knew that Scott Makepeace in Fredericton, he's very interested in, in owls and follows them. So I thought, well, I'm going to give Scott a call. I called him and uh, I didn't have the phone hung up, but Scott drove in the yard. Where's the owl? And uh, at for people that know Grand Lake, uh, it floods. It floods in the spring. And anyway, uh, Scott, I said, well, there it is right there, Scott, the, the nest. And it was... Um, you know, in deep, in fairly deep water. And he says, well, you got a canoe? Yep, got a canoe. So Scott and I got in the canoe and we went out to the tree and uh, Scott, uh, when he arrives, he looks like NB Powers arriving. Uh, he's got all these little shimmy jobs and to climb trees, just like the, the, uh, the power boys climb poles. And Scott jumps out of the canoe and takes up that tree. And I thought to myself, Nelson, why did you ever call this guy? Because there I was at the bottom, the, the darn old snag was sort of swaying a bit from side to side, and I thought, "Oh no, this this is this is going to end up in disaster." But Scott does know what he's doing, and he did get back down, brought the owls, uh, brought the owls back down, and uh, here's here's a picture of a uh, oh dear Scott, you better get some new pants, uh, and he um, uh, puts bands on them and uh, weighs them and then uh, and then he puts them back up in the nest now he has a little bucket that he tears up the tree with and puts them in the bucket brings them down then takes them back and uh, he's never had much problem with that but uh on on with that story uh about two years later that that tree was fell over and uh i called scott and i said i think the owls have uh 
they're they're they've they're going they're not going to be nesting here this year and he says not so sure so again it wasn't uh, <laughs> i think it was before the phone was hung up he arrived with a nest box and darn it if you wouldn't know it those owls nested in that box that very same year that the the tree fell and uh, there's Scott running up the running up the thing with his pot with his uh, bucket, and that's the owl. Those owls' nest, uh, the uh, bird owl's nest, is big, and they got to go high. And uh, it is a it is a big job to get one of those established. But there, there she is. There she's in the nest. And that's um, I took that picture, and boy, if looks could kill. But uh, you know you really got to take care of these nests because uh, what what happens they become uh, raccoon clubhouses during the summer, and uh, this helps quite a bit. These uh, putting pipes around the trees, but it can be very difficult if it's a thick uh, thick area because coons can sort of get from branch to branch. But if you get get enough of them up, it sure helps. <clears throat> Uh, oh yes, oh yes. Now I, I hope that you can recall back to the uh, the great horned owl. There seemed to be a a five part things like here I am, where are you sort of thing. But the, the great horned owl has this call that a lot of people say, "Who cooks for you? Me too." It's a really nice uh, comparison. Who cooks for you? Me too. And let's 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 give that a go. See if it see if it works. That's the most. That's the most like. Oops, uh, crepe. I want to stop it there for a second. But uh, that caterwauling we got into, that, that is very common with the great horned owl. Uh, and that's the adults. And uh, they, you know, the, that one that played first, that's the common one. That's the one you're most likely to hear. But they get into these caterwauling discussions with each other. <clears throat> and uh, a, a lot of this, now it, ha it mostly was happening a little earlier in the year about uh, you know maybe three weeks ago where there was duetting between the male and the female and you can tell the difference there is a, a softer <clears throat> note to the female but the big thing is you hear two and you hear them in two different places it's not like a pair of bald eagles that would land together the pair would land together on a branch together not so with owls uh, they're, they're a little distance apart and they're sort of keeping Announcing the, announcing their territory and uh, bonding, and also at the end of that sound, which I won't play it, there's all these squeaks and stuff too, which are the young uh, calling for food, <clears throat> and also some other sounds that owls will make is is uh, bill clapping, the, the, and it's quite audible. If you irritate them, they will start bill clapping. Now, bird owls or anything else to say? Uh, yeah, just just one little short thing, which I think is going to come up. And yeah, here here's their range. As, as you can see, it's mostly in the, in this part of of uh, North America. In Western North America, they're not uh, not that common. However, out here, the spotted owl is quite common, and they're very closely related DNA wise to the barred owl. And the barred owl is starting to uh, move out that way starting to hybridize with them and it's starting to uh, overtake the spotted owl. So the, the spotted owl is on the decline. Now, uh, oh yes, in, in size, I should mention that the, 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 the barred owl is almost the same size as the great horned owl, almost, a little smaller. <coughs> now, if anything can be called cute, that has to be a cute owl. Now there's one we're going to show just quickly a little later that might be a little cuter. But this is the Sawet owl. 
And uh, now we're, we're getting into the small owls. This is probably the third most common one that you're going to encounter. There is a lot of sawed owls around, but boy, we don't see them. They are very secretive. Uh, th this, this little owl is only eight inches long and it only weighs about 75 grams. And the female, a bit bigger, might weigh about 100 grams, but you know, a budgie weighs 30 grams. So, you know, <laughs> this is a small owl. And it is a cavity nester, as I mentioned. They, they will usually nest in the cavities and trees. But being a cavity nester, they will also take human boxes. And I expect this is one of Randy Loft's from uh, uh, St. Francis. He has a, a big program going with uh, 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 um, sawed owls and also boreal owls that we'll mention in a minute, which we don't get much here. But isn't, isn't this sort of neat? This, this is a youngster. They're, they look totally different when they're, when they're, the plumage is just so different. And this has to be the, whoever got this, man alive, what a picture. I'm not sure who gave me that picture, but boy, that's a pretty precious little picture. Now, <clears throat> as far as uh, putting up uh, solid owl boxes, not, not a great big thing. Uh, Roger Leblanc, he uh, was a buddy who helped me uh, build, a, I shouldn't say he helped me, he pretty well did it, he, uh, a few boxes, and uh, we just put them up a few weeks ago, and that's uh, my nephew and I putting them up. And uh, I want you to take a look at that ladder. That is the most beautiful thing that I've ever purchased. That ladder is completely collapsible. And uh, that, little, that little strap down at the bottom, that goes around it and that's how you carry it. I think the next picture is, yeah, yeah, that's what it looks like sort of wrapped up, but that's not a good picture. I just sort of ripped it off uh, the internet. I, I got the, this one through uh, uh, Amazon, but um, I'm sure there must be other places have them too. But uh, boy, I, I, I just can't wait to be using that on all the swallow boxes that I got to take care of this spring. Here's... Now let, let's play the call. Now the, the, call, the, the call of the male is really distinctive in this one. Uh, it, you can compare it to a truck backing up. Let, let's, let's do a little bit. Now, now this is the main call you'll hear. You will, they, they make other calls too, but this is by far the most common. And they can start this at dusk and go for hours and hours and hours. I don't know, they, they must take time to breathe, but the, the, the male, when he's uh, looking for his mate in the spring, he's trying to impress her, but let's, let's listen. Northern saw wet owl. Not necessarily something you'd... Northern saw wet owl. Not, not, not something you'd normally associate with an owl, is it? <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it, that, is, that is by far the most common sound, and it's, and it's the male. The, the female does make a little bit of a, a sound, from, often from the nest, actually. But uh, with the saw wet owl, they, they, I, I've never seen it, but the literature says that uh, when, when the, the male finds a a mate or, or attracts a mate in and she perches, he will fly around her in circles, pro probably about at least 20 times and then land beside her and offer her lunch in the form of probably a redback vole, which is so common in the forest. So that's taking a lady out to lunch is the, the best way to, to, get you, to get your mate. Uh, oh yes, I got a note here about the, you can hear them, you can probably hear them for about 300 meters away. So, you know, it's not really a long, long ways away. And, uh, you know, I, I, there was a picture earlier where we were putting up those, uh, those nest boxes. Uh, that's where I've heard uh, a sawed owl calling for probably about six years anyway and it was always been in that 
right in that spot. So that's where the, the boxes went up. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm skeptical about them being used, but uh, they're sure not going to be used if they're not up there. So they're up there and waiting. Now the uh, the the sawhead owl, as you can see, has a has a big range in uh, North America. And look, boy, we're we're right in the right right in their uh, in their breeding territory. And this is actually a common owl. I doubt if many of you have seen it, but I bet a lot of you have heard it. And I hope that a lot more of you will recognize it when you hear it, because. <laughs> I hate to be overly, I, th I think I think you're going to hear it this, this spring. Now, the, the, I'm just gonna spend a moment on this one. I'm only putting it in here because it's this, about just about the same size as the saw at a very small owl, but it's from the north. It's one called the boreal owl. And how you can tell the difference if you happen to get one, there's a few up here in, in New Brunswick every year. I think they're, there's suspected to be some breeding in uh, Misku, but uh, I don't think it's been proven. But anyway, the, the big difference is, is that one, one thing you'll notice immediately is that pale colored beak. The Sawet has a dark, uh, dark beak. And also it has uh, spots up here. So we're not gonna spend much time in this one because we don't uh, see there, there, you can really see the spots well there. And see that's, that's by some uh, bird feeders, I think which is a popular spot for them to come. And that's another one there. See the spots? Uh, this, this one popped up in, uh, in Beaujolais, just outside of Moncton, one winter. And there's another one. I see Biff Schneider, that, she got a lovely shot of one there. And that, no, that doesn't seem to be a bird feeder. And they will, they will nest in boxes. And this is, this is very likely one of Randy Loft's uh, boxes for, in uh, Cape Britain. Now, get, get into one that's more, uh, th this one is more common here. This is the short-eared owl. Now, uh, you're, you're, you're lucky if you see this one. This one is very nocturnal, very nocturnal. Uh, they, 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 they usually are in the woods, but they hunt in open territory. But the, the, the uh, one unique thing is uh, with, with the, uh, Short-eared owl, they will in, in the in midsummer they will often gather in roosts of anywhere from two to twenty birds. So, uh, you know, you'd think we'd see more of them. I know uh, Ron Arsenal. I don't know if he's here tonight, but he I, I remember he uh, came across some in a gravel pit in Membrum Cook, and man, there was quite a few of them in there. That's one that Gordon Rattray had had land right in his on a piece of equipment on his farm. Now, as you can see, I don't know, mine, mine's sort of blocked off, but the ears aren't very well in that. So that may be a young bird. And you, the, the, ear tuff, the ear tufts in the um, shirted owl are more, of a, more at a slant than the great horned owl. Sorry, they're, they're, more, uh, they're more upright. <laughs> The, it's the great horned owl that they're more slanted. Now, of course, when they fly, they're always down. Another one of the of the great horned owl. Uh, these uh, this white over the eye is very characteristic, and you don't see that big white bib that the uh, great horned owl has. This is a medium sized owl, about fifteen inches. Now, seven inches uh, doesn't sound like a whole lot of difference, but it is when with a with a bird when you see it. But unfortunately, often you, unless you have something to compare it to, you're not sure of the real size. <coughs> That's a nice, nice photo of a sure uh, long-eared owl. Now, the, the uh, this, this is really in, uh, the call of the uh, long-eared owl is one who, and that's it. Now it does make other sounds, of course, you know, when they're younger feeding and all that, but the, the adults, when they're establishing territory and, and bonds, this is it. And it's very, long -eared very, owl. very simple.
long-eared so, owl. So sure, sure, not sure, not a. Uh, it's it is distinctive. It's only the one. I mean, uh, there's the all the other owls make a, a hoot that's very different. So uh, you know, if you're just hearing one, who think long-eared, and I hope you see it. Uh, that that's that's the range. As you can and as you can see, the range is huge. The uh, long-eared owl that look all all, all across uh, Euro Europe and Eurasia, and all across North America. So. They have a wide range, although, boy, they're not seen very often. Now, this is a really special one. This is the short-eared owl. And it, again, is a medium-sized owl. We run about 15 inches. But if you're going to see a, a short-eared owl, you've got to go where, where their food is. And their, their food is in marshlands and uh, grasslands in the, the Tantramar Marsh has been a very popular place at times when the food supply is there. There was one year, it was absolutely incredible. On the, I guess that would be about four or five years ago. Uh, they were just everywhere. There was so many of them, it was incredible. But there was also an incredible vole population. Uh, th this year we have about um, five. They're on the Riverview Marsh just uh, in downtown Moncton, just across from Chateau Moncton on, on a marsh in between Riverview and Moncton. And a lot of people have got to see them, but don't go during the day. Uh, it's ju just at dusk, that's when they start to. And look, uh, look at this, uh, they have this beautiful, something called a dihedral wing. And uh, you know, they can just get on a little current and hover and almost stay there. It's it's uh, some some people call it kiting. They, they'll they'll just almost stay still or just sort of hover along, and you can you can uh, rest assured that those eyes and that parabola and those uh, those binocular eyes are on on the ground. Now, getting to something about crows and owls. First of all, just note the size here. The crows, the crows about uh, seventeen and a half inches and. Uh, the uh, short-eared owl is about 15 inches, so you can see the, the nice size comparison there. But uh, why do crows hate owls? If, if you see a bunch of mad crows creating a great big ruckus, it's always worth checking out <coughs> because chances are there's an owl in the vicinity. And one of the, the really, the uh, there's no reason that they should be harassing these little short-eared owls because they don't, they don't, they're not going to bother a crow much. However, the great horned owl especially enjoy uh, fledgling uh, crows, enjoy their eggs, enjoy them. So, you know, they, they, they have a hate out for, for owls. And as you can see, they can, uh, they can sure get together on it. That arrow is pointing to a little short-eared owl and that's a mass of crow, crows that are harassing them. They don't actually touch the owl. They just harass it. As you can see, the same thing. Now, the, this, this really is a beautiful slide because it shows the, uh, this parabola effect, or this dihedral, where they can just sort of float like, uh, just imagine those as sails. And you know they can lay them out flat, or they can put them up, put them down, and just sort of float around effortlessly. Now the 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 food the food of these, as I mentioned, is uh, the meadow vole would be the big thing because they're in meadows in grasslands. So the meadow vole is their is their uh, chief diet. If the meadow voles are, are abundant, they're abundant too. And uh, you know a meadow vole, uh, you know that's might seem awful small to us, but holy curl, that's like, you know, one of us down in the three Big Macs, you know, that's a, a darn good meal. Now, th this this is one, uh, Brian Stone got this one at night. Uh, th this was after dark and he used all his flash equipment and he took this one and it never moved, didn't bother at all. But it sure made for a beautiful picture. This, this was again at Tantamar Marsh that year that they were so abundant. In fact, I had my wife down there one night and we were parked on this road and we had the windows open and she got all frightened. She says, you, you got to close the windows. They're going to come in. 
<laughs> they were just flying all over the vehicle. And uh, that, that's one of them, unfortunately, getting harassed by another hawk. And it had to give up its, give up its uh, vole, but it shows a nice picture of a vole. Uh, they, they're really ground, ground birds. They ground nest, nest on the ground. Beautiful picture of them with the, the wings up again. So you can see in that picture why they call it short eared owl. Those ear tufts are short. But again, don't forget, they're not ears. Uh, th this was down in Tantamar at, at night. And I, I don't know if you can count them. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, six in that picture. And that's just in one spot. You could actually see them running across the road after voles with so many of them. And the, the solid owl uh, here again, the look at the range, huge, huge range all over Eurasia and uh, Europe and North America and South America. Now on to the uh, snowy owl. The, uh, the, sn the snowy owl is no question. Uh, it, uh, it, in some winters, we have a surprising number of snowy owls. This winter, we haven't. But they only come down here for one, uh, well, two reasons. Uh, they like lemmings. They, they, uh, they live, that's their main food is lemmings. They also eat ptarmigan and some other birds up north. But uh, they're a very northern owl. And I'll, it'll show in the range in a moment. But they, they, this, this does happen to be our large, biggest owl. It's, a, it's, a, it's the largest uh, owl we have. They're beautiful things, absolutely beautiful things. Uh, notice the, you know, we haven't talked much about it, but the tufted uh, feet, you know, the, the, they're, they're fully um, haired. That's very common with, with owls. And when, when they first arrive, if there's good, oh yeah, I forgot to mention the second reason that they can uh, be here in number. If it happens to be a banner year up there, then, then there's, there might not be enough food for that high a population. Uh, the, sh the short-eared owl, it can, they can have uh, amazing numbers of, uh, you know, up to 14 to 16 eggs in a nest. Now that's of course is is big, but you know if that happens to any extent, then there's going to be a lot of them. So if that could mean that more will come south, and I'm not going to play the call of it. It's essentially a screech. So it, it's it's really a boomer bust for a situation for them up there. They're way to devil up there in the in the north. Now, a lot, in the past, especially, most of us thought if there was a lot of barring on the owl, it was young or a female, and if it was pure white, it was a male. And that may have some validity, but it has been shown that from a, a population out in Saskatchewan, by tagging them and all that, that uh, that doesn't always apply. So it's not particularly critically inf information to know, but we do see a lot of them bird and we don't see all that many of them pure white, but some of them are close to it. But look at the range, look where they are. Holy moly, up there on the coast in the coldest part it could be, and, and not Southern Greenland, but Northern Greenland, Baffin Island, that's their, that's their turf. And that's where they will stay if things are, if things are good. And you know, there, there's uh, that means there's going to be a part of the year when they're hunting in 24-hour darkness. Uh, okay, we're going to go through some of these quick because this is uh, the ones that we're, we don't aren't very often going to see here. This is the great gray owl, very common out west, but we don't have uh, they're a rare visitor here. And uh, you know, whenever one shows up, it often stays in, a, in an area and gets bird watchers in quite a tizzy. Uh, they're quite specific. They, that bow tie on the white bow tie they have, but, but as, I, as I say, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but uh, just to point out to you that they can be here and they do have that specific look. Now, another one that can visit us 
is the uh, northern hawk owl. Uh, th this would be considered a small bird. I think it's around uh, 15, 16 inches as well. So it, it's not a big owl, but the beautiful thing is when these come to visit us, they choose a territory and that is where they will stay the whole winter. And uh, they hunt during the day. So if there's a northern hawk owl somewhere and uh, the word gets out, m most people are going to be able to see it because it stays in that area and it hunts during the day. This year has not been a good year for them. I've had one report and that was on uh, Irving Gated property, which we weren't allowed to uh, go see. But that's, well, that's one from the, the New Brunswick Museum, a nice example. Another one. Now, the, uh, another one that I'm just going to mention quickly is a burrowing owl. Now, the burrowing owl is uh, more common out west, but it is in a bit of trouble. They're, the numbers are going down, but it's a, it's a very small owl, too. It's just bigger than the, the saw-wet owl. <clears throat> but uh, every once in a while, one will show up in New Brunswick. Uh, we don't have any confirmed breeding records, but there, there has been, one, uh, there has been uh, Thought thought to have nested in Jolic here at one time, but I there's no I don't think that's a uh, established for sure. But there was one in Grand Manan two years ago in the fall, and it stayed on these particular group of rocks for gee it must have been about three weeks, and uh, there was an awful lot of people went to see that little owl, which wasn't particularly disturbed. Come and see me, no problem. There he is again. Now, this, uh, we we're talking about cute owls. Uh, this has to come close to the top. This, this is the, uh, the barn owl. And so many people confuse that bird and barn owl. There's two different birds. Uh, this is the barn owl. And this is a barn owl that is in New Brunswick. Uh, this showed up uh, probably four or five years ago in uh, Kent County. A lot of us got to see it, but a lot of us got to see it by chance because it, it was at dusk. But uh, it's not endangered in Canada because there's all sorts of them in Western Canada and down into the States. They, they, it's, it's, a, it's a weather thing. They don't tolerate cold weather. However, if you want to see one in New Brunswick is the Magnetic Hill Zoo. The Magnetic Hill Zoo has absolutely done a wonderful job of breeding their own colony. And they have about a dozen there. And uh, they have them in, in, a, in beautiful surroundings. And uh, in the winter, of course, they're inside. But uh, they have them in beautiful surroundings for people to see them. And, and the owls aren't particularly disturbed by it. Isn't, isn't that some sort of a face? Even a heart, a heart to go with it. And that's that's part of the colony up at uh, Magnetic Hill. And, you know, if they want to steer the devil out of you and get rid of you, that's what they do. The the screech owl, just going to mention that. Uh, it's I don't think we have any breeding records in New Brunswick, uh, but it's it's in Maine. And why they call it the screech owl, I don't know. It doesn't screech. It has a very different sound. I suppose at times it can, but it's one of those names that have no good reason. Anyway, that, that, that is the last slide. So uh, I don't know, just Clara, how you want to handle it from here? Hello, Mrs. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Nelson. Um, we have about four minutes left until 7.30, and we have two questions in the chat, which will work out perfectly. Although if anyone has any last burning questions, feel free to write them out. Uh, the first question is from uh, Pierre, and do you want to unmute yourself, Pierre, and ask your question out loud? Oh, I might have to ask you to unmute one second. Let's see. Okay. Oh, don't have a mic. Okay. So I will read up Pierre's question, which is, uh, what is the biggest animal a great horned owl can eat? Boy, they'll they'll attack a lot of things, but uh, you know, I think a pro probably uh, a skunk. Uh, yeah, I think a skunk or a, a snowshoe hare would be reasonable, but they will attack things bigger if they, especially if they're bothered in their nests. But I, I think that size is. Uh, 
the most manageable. I, I, I did forget, I forget to mention that uh, owls I have a habit of decapitating their prey, especially uh, larger prey, like whole prey, they just swallow down and bring it back up what they don't need. But uh, uh, lar larger prey, they often decapitate them. So if you see uh, the head of something, chances are it was an owl, great horned owl especially. I bet you that was yeah. pure. Just uh, as an anecdote, I told Nelson this already, but I was out hiking in Wellsford last weekend and I found the remains of a bird, but no head. Um, and Nelson was telling me that it was probably a barred owl and that was that had been uh, predated by a great horned owl, right? Did I get those right? Uh, right? Uh, they will, but that's that that prey is a little a little big for them. Okay. Yeah. Um, Actually, I have a follow-up question to Pierre's question, which is, uh, does anything eat owls? Oh, well, um, like the great horned owl will uh, will eat the uh, the smaller owls, no problem at all. Right, okay. Yeah. Does anything eat the great horned owl, though? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, I can't think of anything right off. They're, they're at the top of the food chain. There, nice, there must good be, place uh, to be. Yeah, there must there must be something there out there that will do them besides bother them besides humans, but uh, I think they're they 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 got got it to themselves mostly. Nice. Uh, and then uh, one last question from Louise Nichols, which was partially answered in the chat, but um, Louise, if you want to go ahead and ask it, just so everyone else can hear it, you can go right ahead. Uh, I might have to ask you to unmute. So let me just find you. Oh no, you're good. Go ahead. Okay, I just wondered, Nelson, um, what kind of woods, is there a particular kind of woods or forests that long-eared owls would be more likely to be in? Well, they, they, uh, they're more likely to be in, in uh, a conifer type of forest, but they, they, hunt, they hunt out in the open, but it's mostly in conifer forest, and they just love to get right up next to a, uh, say, a spruce tree to the, uh, the trunk, and just lengthen out and man alive are they cryptic but it, it's usually usually in a in a conifer forest where the, you'd find them and they, and there again they they uh they take over some other nest they don't take it over they use a nest that's been used last year by a crow or raven or something thank you um there's an important comment in the chat from Remy who says that in Halifax, they found a great horned owl nest with 13 cat collars. So keep your cats indoors. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Feral cat, I, I wouldn't think a very uh, a large cat could be a problem, but uh, don't forget that uh, eagles, of course, bald eagles are, they like feral cats too. Yeah, and small dogs too, I'm sure. Yes, yes, I'm sure, you, I, I'm sure you're right. Yeah, yeah, because that's... Yeah. There's some pretty small dogs out there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we are at exactly 730, uh, which is perfect. This is great timing. Uh, so thank you very much, Nelson, for that fantastic presentation. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone for coming and participating. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Uh, I absolutely love owls. I wish I could see more of them, but not so much of a night owl myself, <laughs> pun intended. Um, anyway, so uh, yes, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, and once again, a reminder about that biodiversity conference and the biodiversity panel that we have coming up on April 13th. Uh, Vincent has put a link in the chat again. Uh, so if you would like to sign up or share it with your friends and family, you can go ahead and follow those links. The conference uh, fee is $20, but the evening panel is completely free. So thank you for joining us. Uh, once again, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you on April 13th for either the conference or the panel discussion or both. So have a good night.